morning. Uh, my name is Cam, and I'd like to welcome you to Grant Memorial, whether you are joining us live or online. Now, last week, uh, we hit the pause button on our journey through the New Testament letter of Philippians to hear the testimony of Christopher, Angela, and Leon Yuan, and how God worked in incredible ways, drawing all three of them unto himself through extremely difficult circumstances. Now, if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go check out our website and watch the recorded version of last week's message. I know that it will be a blessing uh, and an encouragement to you. Well, this week we return to Philippians, uh, where we continue to receive direction from the Apostle Paul, the, the letter's author, on what it looks like to live the life we're called to as Christians and as the body of Christ. Now, so far, uh, in light of our faith in Jesus, Paul has encouraged us to be redefined as, as saints in Christ, not defined by what we do. Uh, we've been encouraged to be filled by the Holy Spirit, living by God's power, not our own. We've been encouraged to be hopeful, remembering that this, what we see here now, is not all there is and to remember that the ultimate end or purpose for the Christian is to glorify God both now and for eternity. Well, this week, uh, Paul's challenges and encouragements for us continue. So I would invite you to turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Philippians chapter 1. Yes, we're still in chapter 1, uh, verse 27. Now, if you're using one of the Bibles uh, in the pew uh, pockets in front of you, it's page 1784. And uh, I do want to say, if you don't have a Bible, um, I encourage you, take this one, put it under your arm, and walk out with it uh, as you go. This would be our gift uh, to you. We just want uh, everyone to have a copy of God's Word uh, in, their, uh, in their homes and uh, so that it lands in their hearts. So if you don't have a Bible, take this on us. Uh, but uh, if you do have one, you can use it for this morning. And we're turning to page 1784. Now, for those of you who brought your own uh, Bibles, our reference today is Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 27. This is what it says. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved in that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that, uh, that you would um, allow it to jump off the pages of, of our Bibles and into our hearts, into our minds, and produce fruit in our lives. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time today because we are celebrating nine baptisms this morning, right? Which is incredible. I, I am so happy to share our teaching time uh, by hearing the stories of how God has worked in the lives of people within our community. So we're going to have that celebration a little bit later. But what it does mean is that we're going to travel at a quick pace through our text uh, this morning as we seek to understand what Paul is saying. And while 20 minutes or so will not be enough to exhaust the truth of this passage, I'm sure that it will be enough to challenge, to equip, and to edify us all. Now, as usual, I encourage you to dig deeper at home, right? Not just relying on our Sunday morning conversation here, but to dig into the word at home and uh, to allow God to continue to speak to you through his word. There's a well-known sign hung in the Notre Dame football stadium within the tunnel between the home locker room and the football field with the words written, play like a champion today. And the players on their way to the field touch the sign and commit to represent the Notre Dame colors well, uh, giving everything they have on the football field each and every 
game. This, this sign is a call for the players to live up to a standard and to carry on the tradition that they have inherited. Now, with that in mind, let's listen again to how Paul begins this section of his letter. In verse 27, he says, Whatever happens, consider or conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, while that does seem like a tall task, what a challenge it is for those of us who confess to follow Jesus. I wonder what the world's experience with Christians would be if we woke up thinking these very words every day. Right? If we had a sign over the doorway of our houses that we touched on the way out uh, of our homes into our workplaces and our, uh, our recreational activities that reminded us to live as a Christian today, to live as the saved today, to live as gospel people each and every day. If, if our conduct and our actions were governed by the call to live up to the sacrificial example of Jesus Christ. And I wonder how our conduct would change if we asked ourselves in every circumstance before every decision and every activity we participated in, did Jesus save me so that I could do this? And that's precisely what Paul is getting at here. The, the verb that he uses for conduct yourselves uh, is a verb that was us used in the ancient world in regards to citizenship. To say, you know, act the way that a Roman would act. Or act not like our barbaric enemies, but act like a civilized person. Act like one of us. Or simply represent your kingdom well. That's the language used here. Church. We are called to represent our kingdom well, to represent Christ well. Now, notice that this is not a call to earn salvation, right? Our, our conduct is not a tryout or a test to earn citizenship in God's kingdom, but rather it's a reminder that to, to live the way that those who have been granted citizenship act. Right? Citizenship in, in God's kingdom is a gift granted to us by grace, not by works, Ephesians 2.9. But Paul is saying that those who have received the gift of salvation in thankfulness and gratitude live lives that are different precisely because they have received. In short, acting differently does not save us, but the saved act differently. Now, Paul goes on to describe what this conduct looks like, but before he does that, he makes a curious statement. He says, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence. What is Paul saying here? Well, he's saying, frankly, act this way whether or not you have an apostle looking over your shoulder. Right? This conduct should be consistent. If I'm, if I'm there, Paul says, I will see your godly conduct. If I'm not there, I will hear about it because you are acting it as, as such anyway. Right? And we, we all know how this can go, right? The need for Paul's encouragement here. Right? How many of us, if we're honest, acted the same way when our parents were home than after they left the house? Right? Or, or how many of us speak to our spouses, our children, our siblings, or parents in public the same way that we speak to them in private? Now, I'm not going to point anyone out, but I'm pretty sure there are some here today whose conversation and tone changed significantly when the van doors opened and you stepped out to enter church. Paul is saying consistently live your lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. Be a gospel person at home. Be a gospel person at work. Be a gospel person at church. Be a gospel person when you're by yourself. Be a gospel person everywhere you go. If there's a TV series or a movie that you might not watch if your small group leader was there or if one of the elders came to your house for dinner, maybe don't watch that ever. Right? In all moments, 
not just the public ones. Consistently, Paul says, remember to live in a way that honors Christ and lives up to the price and significance of the gift that you have received. Because here's the thing. Christ did not die for you so that you would be two-faced. That you would be holy sometimes. That you'd have a good public persona or that you would remain enslaved to sin. Ephesians 5, 1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. Things are different. The new is here. Church, play like a champion today. Or better yet, live as a Christ follower today. Now next, Paul addresses uh, what it looks like to conduct ourselves in such a way. And the first thing he says in verse 27 is, stand firm. Stand firm. Firm. Again, just a quick word study. The word here that Paul is using for standing firm was used to refer to a soldier who defended his station or position at all costs, even to the point of sacrificing his life. Church, we are living in a time where it is so easy to waver, to lose ground to give up our position. Each and every day we are bombarded by ideas and opinions that oppose the gospel and reject God and the authority of his word. From science and philosophy classrooms to political rhetoric and legislation, Christian belief is under attack. And we are invited daily to, to shift our position, to slowly, even just inch by inch, surrender territory, to give up ground to lose our station. And it's not always seismic moves, right? It's the creeping, the inching away from the truth as we begin to see and treat the Bible as something other or less than God's inspired word. Or as we start to redefine God's character based on our own definitions. Or as we adjust our convictions to, based on their popularity in our culture, right? Stand Firm is the call here to hold our positions so the enemy does not gain ground. The second characteristic of gospel worthy conduct is to be united. Be united. Uh, it says, stand firm. Listen to the language here. Stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Right? This standing firm, as with anything in the Christian faith, is not to be done alone. Right? And that is a significant reminder that the Christian life is not solitary. We were never meant to do this alone. Way back in Genesis 1, if you open up the very first page of, of your Bible... Uh, and read the creation narrative in Scripture, we read that God created Adam and declared that everything was good. But in chapter 2, well, you don't get very far. In chapter 2, the second chapter in the Bible, God tells Adam what his responsibilities are, both physically, like task-wise, and morally. Let's take a listen to what it says. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. It says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And so God gives Adam his physical responsibility or work responsibility. You're to take care of the garden. You're to take care of creation. And then he gives him his moral responsibility in saying, trust God be obedient and resist temptation. But notice what the very next verse says. Genesis 2.18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. Right? God knew before he even had a chance to mess it up, God knew that Adam could only 
stand firm, fulfill his purpose and moral obligation within community. Right? Church, it's the same for us. We are not meant to, nor is it possible for us, to walk the Christian journey alone. And the literal translation of together as one in our text today is as one man, right? Or as one person. This isn't even talking about Christians walking side by side. This is knowing that Christian living involves deep interconnected community and operating as one organism. And this isn't the only place where Paul uses this word picture for the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, For just as the body, so he's using the human body as his example, for just as the body is one and has many members, hands and feet and legs and mouth and nose, and all of the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Right? A hand cannot live and operate on its own. It just can't. Neither can an eye or an ear. We are but parts of one body, the church, that work together, not in isolation, to stand firm for the truth of the gospel in a world that needs to experience it themselves. Now to further emphasize this, every time it says you in this passage, it's a plural you. Right? So when Paul says conduct yourselves, that's plural. When he says, when I, if I come to see you, he's talking plurally. He says, if I hear about you, or, if, or he says, you stand firm. Those who oppose you, you will be saved, granted to you. You are going through this struggle. All, every single time in this text, Paul says, you, it's plural language. Paul's not talking about the standing firm of an individual, or the striving, or the suffering, or even the salvation of the individual in this passage. He's referring to the body of believers as one. And if we understand what we're called to and what the church is, we know that standing firm means standing together. Which brings us to the next characteristic of lives worthy of the gospel. We don't like this one very much, but it's here. Suffering. Suffering. Stand firm, be unified, and suffer. This is what Paul says. Without being frightened in any way by those opposed you, and later on he says, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Right? The reason you need each other and to stand firm is that opposition is the inescapable reality. Right? Our text doesn't say, if people oppose you, but that people will oppose you. Now, for many of us, most of us, probably, passages like this are completely foreign and have always been uh, metaphorical for us or read as hyperbole, right? That what Paul is saying is simply that there are people who won't agree with us or people who won't like us or who will think that we're weird, right? For the Christian church in North America, the most difficult thing that most of us have had to, to do or endure for our faith is a brief insult like Bible thumper or Jesus freak or currently intolerant bigot, if even that. But it's important for us to realize that our experience is the exception, right, when it comes to living out a faith in Jesus, both in the context of this letter, the early church, and currently around the world, right? The original readers would not have read this thinking, people might not like me because I'm a Christian, or people might think I'm annoying because I'm a Christian, or naive, but rather, if they throw me in prison, or if I'm the next one to be martyred in the Roman Colosseum, I will not be frightened. That's what Paul is saying here. And currently, around the world, there are millions of Christians reading this literally, understanding completely that standing firm will likely lead to imprisonment or death. And friends, our days of reading this figuratively or as hyperbole may too be coming to an end. 
Now, we don't have time to get into all of the details, but there are currently in our country calls from political leaders and even within the Canadian justice system itself to legislate against Christian values and beliefs, calling for jail time for preaching and teaching from the scriptures, right? Labeling the Bible itself as hate literature, as hate speech. That's today in Canada, right now. So for many of us, the call to suffer that we read might not just be something we nod along with, knowing we won't have to deal with it. It may be literally just that, to suffer. Now, as an aside, can I encourage you not to take for granted what we have today, right? The the opportunity to worship freely together, right? And to read and discuss openly the living word of God. Because the day is likely coming in many of our lifetimes when these freedoms may no longer be available to us, right? And friends, if you're not already, now is the time to start memorizing God's word, right? Aware of the reality that the freedom to read it may one day be a thing of the past. Now, we can be depressed about this news, uh, about this reality. We can get all doomsday-ish, but... Let's look at Paul's language here. How does Paul react to this reality that he is living in? He says, It has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. I think a lot of us can check that first one. I believe in God. I believe in him. And we kind of like that part of it. But it's been granted to us to suffer for him. This suffering is granted to us. It's a gift to suffer for him. Did you catch that? That's what Paul's saying. Suffering is a privilege, a gift from God, Paul says. I was talking about this with my dad this week, and he asked if he could re-gift this gift of suffering. Right? Is that the kind of thing I could just re-gift? This doesn't seem like good news or a welcome present to receive. But Paul, who is currently himself in prison at the time of writing this letter, we need to remember that. Paul has some serious street cred in saying this. He says that just as salvation is a gift, so is the invitation and opportunity to suffer for Christ. Right? This invitation is actually good news for the one with the desire to follow in the footsteps of Jesus so their lives have a God-sized impact. As D.A. Carson says, in what sense could it be said of us that we follow Jesus Christ if there's no cross-bearing in our life? That hit me this week. Let me read that again. In what sense could it be said of me that I follow Jesus if there's no cross-bearing in my life. Truly, following Jesus brings us along a path that's not all comfortable because the, the path that Jesus walked was not an easy path. As Jesus himself taught in Mark 8, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Taking up your cross, when Jesus spoke those words, was not hyperbole. It was probable. And as we know throughout history, over 70 million Christians have literally taken up their cross, being martyred for their faith in Jesus. We have some pretty amazing ancestors. An incredible legacy and tradition that we follow as we hit that sign, live like a Christ follower today. Now there's so much more we can dig out of this text, but the most important thing that we can't miss as we wrap up is the why behind it all. Right? What, what are we standing firm in? What are we striving for? Why are we banding together as one? What are we suffering for? And the answer is simple, and it's the first thing that Paul says. The gospel. Live lives worthy of the gospel. Worthy of the truth that while we were still sinners, dirty, guilty, and stained by our own rebellion against God, Jesus Christ washed us clean by his blood shed on the cross where he took all of our our mess-ups, our missteps, our guilt and our shame, and when he died, he brought it all to the grave. 
And on the third day when he rose again, he left it all behind, giving us the chance to be pure, clean, and blameless before God from now until eternity. And that's what we're celebrating today. That is our fight, church. The gospel, not comfort, not ease, right? Not, not political agreement. The gospel is our fight. The gospel is the ground that we do not abandon, right? The gospel is what we give our lives to, as Paul starts off in this text, no matter what happens. Now today, in a few moments, we have the privilege, I hope we see it this way, we all have the privilege of standing with nine of our fellow believers, members of our very body, witnessing their declaration that they believe and have been saved by this gospel. And that we, and that they want to stand firm with us in unity no matter what happens. So while they are making this declaration, we too are saying something by our presence here. We are committing as a church family to walk with them, to support them, to care for them, and to help them stand firm in the declaration that they make today. May we take our part in this seriously. But let's not forget to celebrate a little too. And may we not forget that all of this is for Christ, through Christ, and because of Christ and the good news that comes 